frightened and frustrated because I put blood, sweat, and tears in making sure we have enough food and supplies to get us through any disaster. But I never thought my dad would die from a scratch. So why am I sharing this story with you today? It's simple. I used to believe the biggest threat in any crisis was the lack of food, water, or shelter. But the truth is, the number one killer in a crisis is disease and infection. And it doesn't matter if it's an earthquake, terrorist attack, or the collapse of the dollar. One of the first things to kill most people in a crisis is an illness or disease. It took me years to get over what happened, and I needed answers. I talked to doctors and friends, and I researched for months. And here's some jaw-dropping facts I uncovered. Most Americans think our medical system is the same as other first world countries, but in fact our medical system is a ticking bomb waiting to explode. The American College of Emergency Physicians, ACEP, rates our medical system with a D plus, and in some states it only manages a startling F minus. This means if there's a major emergency, your hospital won't be able to help you. During Katrina, non-threatening illnesses turned deadly because of lack of supplies and medicine. Imagine what would happen if we faced a national disaster. Hospitals would be packed to the brim within hours, or even worse, closed down for good across the country. Minor conditions could turn deadly in days, even hours, without medical care, and the death toll would be astronomical. And you won't get life-saving medicine even if you tried, because pharmacies will shut down or get ransacked by addicts. Trucks carrying medical supplies stop with the next terrorist attack, natural disaster, or economic meltdown, and pharmacies are emptied within minutes. And that's not all. Public services like police, ambulances, garbage collectors are out of commission for days, weeks, even months at a time. When the hurricane hit New Orleans, it knocked out both power and running water. And when the grid is down, sewage and water systems fail. Raw sewage literally runs into the streets and contaminates the water supply beyond repair. The bottom line is, with no clean running water, power, and medication to prevent diseases, and no hospitals to control the spread of diseases, you and your family will be in serious danger. After my father's death, I realized how oblivious I'd been to the real danger. I couldn't live with the thought of my kids dying because of some scratches. I knew I had to do something. I glued myself to the computer and I worked like a dog. I spent the first few months looking on forums and websites, but I found nothing. The only answers I found were stockpiling medicine or getting some first aid training. The problem is first aid training is not enough. First aid is designed for one thing and one thing only, to get someone to a hospital. But you don't always have this option during a crisis. I racked my brain for months trying to find the answer, but kept coming up short. I didn't know where else to turn. And then one day, I stumbled on an article about Romania. I finally realized the answer may lie in poor countries. Romania is a European Union country, but just barely. It's also one of the poorest countries in Europe, and poorer than many African states. Romania's entire national health budget is $2.6 billion, two times less than John Hopkins Hospital for a year, which makes it on par with many third world countries. I discovered that very often Romanian doctors are forced to treat their patients only during daylight. Why? Because there isn't enough money to pay for power bills. And patients have access to only $811 worth of treatment, while a U.S. patient's life is worth more than $8,000. Yet people of all ages are saved every year with simple medical techniques and generic medication. And guess what? They stay alive and healthy. I realized the answer to my problems didn't lie in American medicine, but in third world medical secrets. Two years ago, I found a Romanian doctor willing to help me. His name was Radu Skurfu, and he's a general surgeon. But he's not your typical first world doctor. Radu's a special kind of doctor who's seen both sides of the medical world. He lived and graduated from medical school in Romania, and he was trained outside the first world comfort zone of unlimited supplies and technology, where need often exceeds want and where doctors are forced to pay out of their own pocket to get things like gauze or syringes to treat patients. And then he moved to work and live in Germany, one of the world's leaders in medicine. And he's seen the latest technology and medical techniques. 
When I asked him how they did things in Romania and how did you manage to keep so many people alive without modern medicine and